Welcome back, everyone. It is chapter 10 of Introduction to Art. This chapter is called Art and Ritual Life. The subtitle is The Symbolism of Space and Ritual Objects, Mortality and Immortality. Let's get going. We have learning outcomes to begin the chapter, of course, a section on exterior ritual spaces, the sacred interior, masks and ritual behavior, and finally, funerary spaces and grave goods. So after completing this chapter, you should be able to identify and describe architectural forms used for ritual purposes and their association with specific religious groups, recognize the symbolic and functional components of architectural centers for worship, including building parts, auxiliary structures, and furniture, as well as to discuss its significance and uses. You'll be able to identify and describe sculpture, paintings, and other objects that are used to express beliefs, to teach religious doctrine, and to perform ritual acts. Finally, you'll be able to recognize and discuss some of the specific forms of art associated with funerary and memorial functions in different belief systems. So I think most of us are familiar with Stonehenge in England, a prime example of an exterior ritual space as there was no roof covering. We also have the uh, Heiau at Waimea, if I'm pronouncing either of those correctly, I'm sorry, a Polynesian, uh, well, Hawaiian and Polynesian uh, a ritual structure. This did have an interior space, however, so this could be a little misleading. Apparently, the structure did cover a an altar area. And then there's also the Tori Gate in Japan. This is from the Shinto religion, one of Japan's two main religions, along with Buddhism. And the Tori Gate frames views and acts as a kind of, a, and the, these gates in general, not necessarily this particular one, it acts as a way of, of providing a transition for the visitor or believer to a different sort of spiritual space by passing through it. Then we have the sacred interior. This is this may seem a little odd since we're looking at uh, towers that typically aren't meant for your average person to go into. They weren't typically a space where one would go in to perform a religious function. Although in the case of the minaret, the imam would go up and issue a call to prayer. Typically in Christian churches, the towers were connected to the structure, although Giotto's Campanile in Florence uh, from the 14th century, that was a separate structure. But the Lincoln Cathedral in England here, the towers actually emphasize certain architectural elements, like the taller tower uh, indicating the, uh, the, the center, the very center of the church where the two sections cross. Here are more examples of interiors of religious buildings. There's the Baroque pulpit at Amiens Cathedral in France, and also the Islamic minbar or pulpit in a mosque in Egypt. And just the exterior of the mosque is shown for reference. But notice the uh, rather intricate structure of both these, both the pulpit and the minbar um, as a way of drawing the uh, as the believer's attention to what was going on during a sermon, for instance. Now, sculptural and painted expressions of belief. The rocker in the from a Shaker village. Now, this is an interesting example because it does have some similarities to the Pieta on the right, believe it or not. Um, the rocker expresses the Shaker's belief in form following and Fun form following function, excuse me, and the simplicity that they sought to bring to their everyday lives. So there is a similarity uh, with both of these, uh, I guess we could call one, we could call them both structural objects, but the one on the left, of course, is a functional piece of furniture, but they are a reflection of their culture's belief systems. 
Now we have masks and ritual behavior, two very different examples, an Eskimo medicine man shown from the late 19th century, apparently uh, attempting a cure on a young, uh, on, a, on a boy. And then the Mardi Gras masks in Belgium, uh, and these are this is a rather recent photograph, but in both cases, the masks allow for the transformation of the individual. Mardi Gras on the right, that was more of a kind of party um, uh, as a prelude to Christian Lent, which would begin the next day. But the mask allowed for a kind of, um, you might call it a free-for-all, where identities could be exchanged or hidden, whereas on the left, the Eskimo medicine man is basically, I, I think, sort of channeling higher forces in order to bring them down to earth, but it's a kind of transformation of his personality too. Now, funerary spaces and grave goods, we have these uh, Chinese examples a ding means this cauldron style form that we see on the right. This is not necessarily from a tomb. They were used for other purposes, but generally ritualistic purposes. You One could light a fire under them and heat liquids, for instance. And then the altar set on the right, which I think is from the Metropolitan Museum. This is sort of the sort of thing that may have been buried in a tomb for use in the afterlife by the deceased. And then finally, we have this fantastic watercolor overview of the Ming tombs from uh, uh, outside of Beijing. And this does still exist. As you'll see in our textbook, there are still remaining guardian animals that you see here at the very center of the image and some of the gates. Many of these tombs have not been exca excavated, so there is more to come. Thank you for joining me for this very brief overview of chapter 10. As always, I do recommend reading the chapter because it provides a lot more information. I just wanted to give you a kind of summary of what you can expect to find and what you can look out for. Thanks for joining me.